I've always been at home on the road. As a kid, sitting backwards in the back of our family's AMC Gremlin on long cross-country trip, I felt at home. I'd watch us pull away from the place that we called home in a little tiny town where I'd always felt out of place. As a geek loser who couldn't do those high, stiff 1980s bangs, labeled a freak at school, just socially doomed. But summer was great. No status quo, no paranoia about social cliques or standards, a new life with every trip, a new place where I had no history, change. Sitting backwards, I'd see where we'd just been, receding off into the distance. If we were traveling west, I was looking east. When I turned around, I would join the forward-facing discovery of making our own way. We'd argue about what to eat along the way, sometimes getting lost. These are the clear images, the, the moments, the maps of my formative years. I love maps, weird points of interest. I remember the shock of discovery that navigation by roadside attractions is not the most common approach to wayfinding. It is not how most people drive, but for me, it's what road trips are meant for. My life as the creator of the world's largest collection of the world's smallest versions of the world's largest things involves a lot of back road travel in search of the superlative. My work is centered around recording and interpreting in shadow boxes and in miniatures, my wanderings through American culture as expressed by place. Maps are both a guide to the source of my art and a part of that art. Remember learning that if you knew one direction on a map, you had those other three? It's the quintessential from one thing, know all. You can find yourself. You can see where you've been. You can plot out where you're going. I am from the middle, the middle of the country, in the middle of the middle estate. If you throw a dart at the map of the U.S. and hit it dead center, I live 11 miles south of that point. I chose to live in the middle as a way to balance out the loves, the love of the road, the love of independence, the love of travel, and of living on the cheap, which all artists love. It is the same distance east to west, north to south, the perfect home base for me. As I've come and gone from this middle place, it's become more and more of a home than just a home base. Rooted in a small community while branching out in a network of blue highways and atlas spots that join together to create a portrait of the United States based on stories of place. Road trips bring my explorations full circle in a unified examination of our unique American road-based culture. In a way, it's the roadside stories that are the compass points to my experiences. Stories point me towards the meaning of where I've been. A lot has happened to me in every direction, but let's go west, young audience, to see what I mean about what it all means. After a trip to, a, to Seattle for an art car show, I was driving around Washington State in my stripy bus, seeing some big things, including the world's largest egg in Winlock. My bus caught the attention of Winlock Sheriff, who came over and said, you know, the circus is out at the fairgrounds. The bus did look very circus-like, so that was a legit assumption. But I explained, I'm not with the circus. I'm just here taking pictures of the world's largest egg. He looked puzzled. You're not staying for egg days? It's this weekend, just a few days from now. You really should stay. I did end up staying, so I had a few extra days to research the story of the egg and the history of Winlock's celebration. As it turns out, the world's largest egg once met the world's largest frying pan. Now, first, a little bit about the frying pan. It is a real pan created in 1941 for the Long Beach, Washington's annual clam festival. First, the giant pan would be used as a parade float carrying that year's clam queens through Long Beach. Then the clam queens would climb out of the pan and the pan would be heated up to fry up gooey ducks, giant squirting clams for their clam festival. Then, as a promotion of their clam industry, the giant frying pan toured the state of Washington, accompanied by dignitaries and a few select clam queens. When the pan came to Winlock, things got even better. They decided to make the world's largest omelet in the world's largest frying pan at the site of the world's largest egg. This was big. 
They heated the pan over a huge fire and then had one of the clam queens strap slabs of bacon to her feet and had her skate around the hot pan to grease it up for the eggs. I knew right then and there that I'd made the right decision to go west and delay my return to the middle so that I could truly soak up the local flavor of this small town celebrating in such a big way. Egg queens were crowned. The high school gym opened up to serve free egg salad sandwiches. Not recommended. And an hour-long parade snaked through the small downtown. And you know who the Grand Marshal was that year? A certain lady who in her youth once skated with bacon feet inside the world's largest frying pan. I've seen a lot of strange things, but the stories are often stranger, and sometimes it's the stranger who is the story. My map is full of circled superlatives to see, scattered dots to connect in an oddly American shape. After visiting one Iowa dot, a 45-ton Hereford bull named Albert, I consulted the map to see where my next destination might be. A dot around Sac City, simply labeled ball of popcorn. This was pre-Google, so I had little information besides that to go on. So as I drive around Sac City, I'm expecting to see signs or a looming orb of popcorn. I didn't find one, so at that point, it's time to ask a local. The only thing open downtown was a bar, so a girl walks into a bar. I sit next to a local just getting his beer from the bartender lady. As she leaves to go pour one for me, I turn to the man and I say, I hear there's a giant ball of popcorn around here. Do you know anything about it? The bar falls silent and the man slowly turns his head and gives me a glare. Without a word, he slams down his beer and he leaves. The bartender was just coming back and asked what happened. I just asked him if he knew anything about the big bowl of popcorn. He got mad and he left. She laughed and then explained, we did have a giant bowl of popcorn here. It's made the traditional way, popcorn held together with caramel. It was big, taller than a tall man could see over. So it had to be kept down at the fairgrounds. Whenever anybody came to see our big bowl of popcorn, somebody would have to stop what they were doing, go down to the fairgrounds, open up the barn door, roll out the ball. The tourists would take a picture. They'd roll the ball back in, close the barn doors. And there you go. I mean, every time it was that whole production. People got tired of it. So we decided to blow it up at our county fair. Everyone shows up. So excited. The ball has seven sticks of dynamite inserted down into it and the countdown starts. We're all on the edge of our seats, but when they whooped the little whooper thing, nothing happened. The ball just kind of burped and a piece about the size of your head fell off the front. Well, the crowd rushed the field and we tore the ball apart with our bare hands. I said, wow, that is a great story, but why did that guy get so mad? Him, he's the guy we hired to blow up the ball. Now, spinning our compass to the east, we find history writ large with one of my favorite world's largest things. It took me a while to go east. I always had that romantic notion of the west as the frontier and the east as this past tense place full of monuments and Civil War battlefields. But high on my list was an iconic structure that, while historic, is certainly not stuffy. America's oldest surviving, world's largest thing, Lucy, the Margate Elephant. She is a six-story, wood-framed, tin-skinned construction built in 1881, and was one of three pachydermic palaces that dotted the New Jersey shoreline. Coney Island had the Elephantine Colossus, Cape May had the Light of Asia, and Lucy stood her beachfront ground in Margate City, just south of Atlantic City. Of those three, only Lucy survived into the 20th century. My first visit to Lucy was in my mobile museum. I was an artist in residence at the Delaware Center for Contemporary Art and would take day trips to fill in some more of my map spots. New Jersey was an easy drive from Wilmington, even in the small transit bus that served as the mobile museum at that time. When I got to Lucy, I joined a stream of tourists buying tickets for a chance to explore the historic innards of this 65-foot elephant. 
a door in one of Lucy's hind legs opens, revealing a small spiral staircase. That leads you up to a landing about midway up Lucy's butt. From there, a couple more steps bring you into Lucy's belly cathedral room, this beautiful curvilinear space full of the history of Lucy and the town of Margate. Climbing from there, you can go up to the Howda, and all of Margate City spreads out before you. Or you can climb into Lucy's head and peer out her eyes, round portals overlooking the Atlantic Ocean. Then guests are led back down Lucy's other leg, down another spiral staircase, and let back down onto the ground. Lucy is both kitsch and genuinely monumental. She is the only elephant you can go through alive, and she's been an anchor for my subsequent seaside explorations. And then there's the not so genuinely monumental. There are a lot of world's largest peanut claims out there, but is there any disappointment quite like going to see an alleged world's largest thing and it turns out, well, not so large? In Durant, Oklahoma, you will find signs for the world's largest peanut, but it's more accurately described as the world's largest peanut disappointment. Seriously, any of us here could build a larger one over the weekend. Their tiny three-footer is dwarfed by Ashburn George's 10-foot tall fiberglass goober made even more impressive by an elevated placement and a golden crown. It's illuminated at night, so anyone traveling along George's I-75 can fully appreciate its superlative superiority. Size aside, although size does matter in the world of world's largest, especially when it comes to peanut size, what all of these monuments do do is pay homage to an industry of the area, elevating and illuminating one of the humblest of crops as a cornerstone of economic bounty, a source of sustenance and meaning in the agrarian South. Still, when it comes to world's largest, you have got to commit. Sometimes committing to the monument is inspired by the commitment the monument commemorates. Sometimes the compass point of the story is a kind of true north. On Third Avenue in the little North Wisconsin town of Woodruff is a brown, roughly formed bas-relief penny set on its edge, tall enough that the top of my head is just underneath Lincoln's nose. It's not the most beautiful monument, it's crudely crafted, but the story is everything about why these monuments are built. Lovingly, using the best skills of a community to honor a part of themselves that merits legendary superlative status. The world's largest penny is dedicated to Dr. Kate Newcomb, known as the angel on snowshoes. Dr. Kate was a small town doctor in the 1930s, 40s, and 50s, caring for the families of Woodruff, specializing in delivering babies. Now, Dr. Kate's practice was strictly house to house, so in winter, that meant that she was making her house calls on snowshoes. This tiny little lady snowshoeing through the North Wisconsin woods, delivering babies anytime, day or night. Dr. Kate knew that this was ridiculous. The town needed a hospital. There had to be a better way to do this. So she approached the city fathers about building a hospital. They said that is way too expensive and the population just can't support it. Dr. Kate knew the population better than anyone else, so she set about to change their minds. In 1953, she asked everybody that she had ever served to gather as many pennies as they could. School children, nearly all of them brought into the world by Dr. Kate, mounted the Million Penny Campaign. News of this little town's commitment went national with donations pouring in from all over the country. Some months later, Dr. Kate and the fine folks of Woodruff assembled a million pennies in the school gymnasium to prove to the city that there was indeed community support for a medical center. Those million pennies served as the seed for Lakeland Memorial Hospital, an institution that still serves that community today. And that commitment is commemorated by a giant concrete penny for Dr. Kate, the angel on snowshoes. Stories like this are why I drive around looking for the next world's largest thing. Making a career out of it, I admit, has been a little weird. 
Some mornings I lay on the floor looking up at the ceiling of my little 1920s house, paralyzed by unanswerable questions knocking around my head. Is this work important? Do people even care about these stories, about my stories? Am I still making art? Luckily, my bladder usually forces me past the paralysis, and while the questions still swim and knock about, they can do so while I'm doing things that take me forward. Because the answer is almost always, I don't know. These things, these creations, these meanderings, these stories, they cannot be easily defined. There's a mystery in all of it that is as deep as memory. Looking back at where I came from, watching the road wind through the world, going out and coming back, an arrow shot into adulthood, arcing towards a circle on the map. Somewhere in between the map and what it means is the world's largest life for me. Thank you.